Hi everyone, it's Tanya Sherry from the Health Leadership and Learning Network here in the Faculty of Health at York University. Thanks for joining us today. We just want to make and it looks like everybody is in. So welcome everyone and we will start. So we'll just do a quick introduction for our speaker today. Um, Dr. Rosemary Kaur is a PhD and um, RN and she's currently our program director for our wound care and our patient navigator um, certificate programs that we offer here in the Health Leadership and Learning Network. We are the continuing education and professional development arm of the Faculty of Health here at York University. And we're really pleased that you could all join us today. Um, Rosemary is also an instructor um, in the Masters of Health Sciences and Nursing uh, program at Athabasca in, uh, University. And she also um, teaches and is on faculty at um, Health Sciences in Health Sciences at Western. Rosemary has spent um, uh, more than two decades as an advanced practice nurse and acute care nurse practitioner, as well as a wound care specialist at London Health Sciences Center. Uh, Rosemary has such deep knowledge and has spent the majority of her career within the area of wound care. She also has extended knowledge in First Nations and Indigenous health and has worked with many um, health centers and clients um, in the indigenous communities, uh, such as in British Columbia. Uh, Rosemary is also a founding member of the Ontario Wound Interest Group, and she's co-chair of the Seniors Health Knowledge Network Group, uh, developing the My Skin Health Passport for older adults. And for the last six years, uh, Dr. Kaur has been on the executive, including as president of the Canadian Association of Advanced Practice Nurses. I could go on and on. Rosemary has pretty much written the book, um, literally on wound care, because a chapter of her work is, sits in a, the wound care um, uh, chapter sits in a book that's currently used, used in nursing programs. I'm sure I haven't said that correctly. Rosemary, but you have literally written the book in this area. So um, I'm going to very proudly and without further ado, pass this over to Rosemary. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I'm really happy to um, offer this particular uh, webinar for people. I, I took a look at the, um, at the participant list and you know, I noticed that there are a bunch of uh, participants who are healthcare professionals. Um, and I, I wanna point out that this course or this webinar today is really focused on the kinds of tips that um, I would want to see uh, available for family members um, and for patients around wound care. Um, and, you know, I think part of, uh, coming uh, into this, if you're a healthcare professional yourself, is, you know, hopefully some of these tips will be things that you can use when you're talking to, or think about when you're talking to your patients and to their family members. Um, because it's not your wound, it's theirs. Uh, and I think that's really important to pay attention to. So hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, and I'm coming to you from beautiful New Brunswick uh, today. Um, and very happy to be here. So I wanted to, um, first of all, just be able to kind of, I was thinking about what are the typical sorts of questions that I hear from families, from patients and from families. Um, and on top of that, I think the other thing that I have experienced in my career is uh, situations where patients and families were not really well informed um, and that can lead to a lot of uh, grief for patients, families, um, and for the healthcare organizations themselves. And I'm sure, you know, you're very aware of situations that have been reported in the media around, um, you know, pressure injuries that have happened where uh, individuals have died or you know, have gone on to have serious complications and the families have been unaware of what's going on or, you know, appear to be unaware. So I wanted to really focus on, you know, bed sores, so pressure injuries, decubitus ulcers, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think the important thing for, for family members is to recognize that 
calling something a decubitus ulcer um, uh, or a pressure injury is the same thing as a bed sore. So, you know, just to make that pretty clear. Um, the other thing I want to address is what should people be looking for <clears throat> if there is a bed sore? What should they know about dressings and treatments? Just really basic general kind of information. And what can I expect from my healthcare providers? So that's what I'm going to talk about today. So, you know, the first thing is how can I prevent a bed sore from happening? And the other thing to think about is bed sore is on a particular kind of part of the body, but it's really skin breakdown. So what we're looking at is how do we prevent skin breakdown from happening? And um, the skin, you know, many of the, the individuals um, are older uh, who end up with skin breakdown or bed sores. And the thing that we need to think about is what happens to skin as we get older. And this, everybody, you know, happens to everyone. So it's increased dryness, easy, much easier to bruise. People heal more slowly. You'll notice too that with your elderly family member that they are often wearing a couple of sweaters or they've turned the thermostat up when you think to yourself, it's roasting in here. Um, so they often feel chilly. Um, people develop wrinkles, again, depending on, you know, their exposure to the sun, smoking and, and genetic um, composition as well. Again, depending on sun, environment and genetics, people can, this is when people tend to develop skin cancers or precancers. So, you know, that's another thing to, uh, to think about. But this is what happens to the skin. And I wanted to put this in, you know, this, I'm, believe me, we're not going to spend all our time sort of back in you know, the uh, pathophysiology course, but <clears throat> just to recognize that um, the thing that happens to skin as we age is this thinning of attachments. And the reason I wanted to have this, so in this little diagram that you can see, that red, the area where it looks a little bit like um, kind of a, an egg crate uh, composition. So on the, the sort of top piece, that's the epidermis. So the epidermis is your very top layer of skin. The epidermis and the dermis, where they connect together, now they've been separated out for this illustration, but where they connect together begins to thin. And so those attachments that we normally have with our the epidermis, the top layer of skin and the one directly underneath it, they tend to begin to thin as people get older. And this is why you will often have elderly people who have skin tears. You know, why doesn't somebody who's younger get skin tears in the same situation? Because their skin is actually um, in better condition. Decreased elasticity, decreased vitamin. We need vitamin D synthesis to promote healthy skin and healthy bones. Um, impaired sensory perception, so people don't necessarily know when they've hit themselves on something or when they're lying in bed for a prolonged period of time. Decreased sweating and sebum production, so that gets back to that drying out of the skin. And skin is just more prone to damage as people get older. So, you know, it's, like I said, these are important things to pay attention to with our aging population. And I would say that if you have elderly family members, this is something to, you know, to keep in the back of your mind. So another thing that happens, and I, I will say that there are some um, graphic images here. I've stayed away from anything that would be, I would think of as being, you know, too scary, but um, just to let you know that there are a couple of pictures in here that, you know, so you're not surprised. Um, so incontinence uh, is something that occurs. People don't always like to talk about the fact that maybe they are wearing a continence brief. Um, but it is important to pay attention to changing those continence briefs regularly and cleaning the area as well. So urea, which is um, in urine, um, turns into ammonia and ammonia creates a high pH level, which changes the, um, that very top layer. See that purple layer, which is the acid mantle. It's called the on the skin, so the epidermis 
It's the acid mantle, which is something that protects our skin from bacteria. So the acid mantle, if it becomes alkaline, it doesn't work effectively to prevent bacteria. The other thing that happens is if there are feces, those digestive enzymes that are actually in the fecal material can still be activated on the surface of the skin. And that barrier function of the skin, that acid mantle, that protective layer of the skin, can be overwhelmed by bacteria. Um, and that's one of the other things that we need to pay attention to. So incontinence is a big uh, issue. Cleaning and protecting skin. Um, it's important to clean that peri area. So, you know, um, that you're the bottom needs to be well cleaned. Bar soap uh, tends to reduce that acid mantle that we have. So people tend to have drier skin. The thing to remember is to, um, if you're thinking about products, would be soaps that are neutral, like fragrance free or for sensitive skin, you know, and there are a lot more now out there that are like that, as opposed to something that has perfume in it, or is really highly scented. You want to avoid those kinds of um, products because they do tend to dry out the skin. So um, a no rinse body wash is a good thing as well, or a specific kind of perineal cleanser. If you've, if you're, you know, if your family member, if this is something where they are in a continence brief or an adult diaper, um, and they do need, you know, frequent uh, changes of the of the continence brief or the adult diaper, a perineal cleanser is not uh, is something that would be a good investment because it is really easy to um, to use um, and it can just be sprayed on and then wiped off. Non scented baby wipes they work really well too. You know, um, so something that's non scented you want to avoid anything that's got you know heavily perfumed, for example. So. Um, one, of the, one of the components of skin breakdown or bed sores, pressure injuries, I mean, they're called pressure injuries because they, you know, they're caused by pressure. So it's important to decrease the pressure. And if you think about you know, the way you're sitting in a chair, for example, you're moving your body because you know, one cheek starts to get a little uncomfortable, so you're going to shift your weight. Or if you're crossing your ankles or your knees, you're going to shift because at a certain point, it's going to start to be uncomfortable. If someone doesn't have good sensation, they can't necessarily feel that it's uncomfortable, so they don't move. So we need to make sure that we reposition people. And that's something that, you know, we've often used this sort of turning schedule. And I always say to people, you know, don't think about it like rotisserieing. It's not, you know, you're done on your left side, so now we're going to go on your right side. It's really a matter of repositioning. You want to get the blood flowing back into that area. So just shifting somebody often is all you really need to do. The 30 degree rule means that you want to have um, the person no higher than 30 degrees for most of the time. Now, obviously, when people are eating or they're sitting up in a, in a wheelchair, they're sitting in a chair, that they're going to be sitting um, more like, a, you know, at 90 degrees. You do want to only keep them in that position for a short period of time, so not all day. So, and certainly using a pressure reduction surface is important too. So on their mattress or their wheelchair, um, these should be pressure reduction. If people are in these all the time or for a good portion of the day, uh, you want to make sure that they're able to, um, that they have pressure relief. Um, you want to protect people's heels. This is probably one place that is not always looked at, but you want to keep the heels off the surface of the bed or the chair, if they've got, um, you know, the supports in their wheelchair. Um, so you want to have their heels kind of floating. So this is an example here just to use, you can use a pillow, um, and you want to have the heel off the bed surface or off the surface you would ordinarily put some kind of foam wedge or roll towels at the foot of the bed to keep the foot from 
doing this. So you don't want foot drop. You want to make sure that they're, you know, that their feet are, are maintaining the position and that they're, that you are not just leaving them in that one position. So I'll we'll talk about that in a minute. One of the other key uh, components for um, to decrease the potential for skin breakdown is nutrition. Nutrition and water intake. These are really, really important. Does your family member need help with eating? So, you know, just the things around cutting the food, right-sized bites. Um, do they wear dentures? Do the dentures fit? Sometimes what happens uh, if people wear dentures, but they've lost weight, their dentures don't fit properly and they have trouble chewing. Um, or the dentures are in the drawer, you know, and they don't, they're not useful when they're just in the drawer. Does your family member choke on food? Um, so maybe a swallowing assessment needs to be done, uh, in which case it's important to talk to the healthcare professional. That's what HCP stands for, is healthcare professional. Supplements like Onshore or Resource are useful, but they're supplements. So, you know, think about uh, also talking to the dietitian um, in the institution if they're in long term care. Um, you know, see if you can talk to the dietitian about improving your mom or dad or uncle or aunt's um, or spouse, uh, you know, improving their condition. Um, by, you know, nutrition. What can we do to help that? Ensure that they're taking in enough water. Uh, hydration is really, really important. And a lot of older people don't drink much. Um, and they don't like to drink, you know, sometimes because they think if I, if I have too much, if I drink too much water, I'm going to have to get up to go to the bathroom in the night. And I don't want to do that because I have trouble getting out of bed. So, you know, think about how can we ensure that they have adequate fluid during the day so that they're not drinking a lot of, they don't have to drink a lot of water at, you know, from seven o'clock at night on, for example. Maybe smaller, more frequent meals would work. Um, a lot of people as they get older are, uh, you know, their, their appetite changes. So why not offer them smaller, frequent meals? And food's a social time, right? We don't just eat to, um, you know, for our bodies to survive, we eat as something that is pleasant and an activity that we enjoy. So make mealtimes pleasant, you know, sit and talk. So what should I be watching for? Um, um, Tanya, interrupt me if there is, you know, any questions or anything. Will do. So what should I be watching for? So skin breakdown, like I said, is all about pressure. You want to look at pressure points. And I have to say, you know, one of my observations about families, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, um, but one of my observations with families is that they're really reluctant to look. And I know it's your mom or your dad or your spouse, <clears throat> or your child. Um, but it's really important that if you are providing care or if you are overseeing or want to make sure that they're getting the care they need, it's important to take a look. Um, there were many times, I, whenever I did dressing changes, I all, if there was family in the room, I always said to them, would you like to stay? Um, you know, assuming and asking the patient first if that was okay with them. Um, and because I think it's really important for people to know what's going on, you know, like I said at the beginning, it's, it's not, this wound is not mine. <laughs> it's, it's the patients, it's that person. So it's really important that they know what's happening to their body. Um, and it's important as a family member or caregiver um, that you also are aware of what's going on. So look for pressure points. So places anywhere that has um, bone close to the surface of the skin. So, or, or bone, even if it's not close to the surface of the skin because maybe they're a little overweight, but still elbows, heels, back of the head, between the knees, their bottom, so their sacrum, you know, that's one of the places as well. Um, 
any of these points we need to really look at, look for areas of redness. So when you press those, so if you take your hand, you know, and you put your thumb on your other hand over your thumb and you press and you take that away, it will, it will blanch. First of all, it will blanch. So it goes kind of white or pale. And when you take the pressure off, it will turn pink again underneath because your blood is returning to that area that you've pressed, right? Um, if it doesn't do that, if it stays red, then that's a place where you need to be concerned. And rubbing it is not a good thing. You want to offload the pressure. You want to remove the pressure from that area. So repositioning the person, putting wedges, you know, foam wedges, making sure that they're not, um, that those pressure points aren't touching, uh, you know, that, that you're relieving that pressure. With darker skin, you want to look for changes in color compared with the surrounding area. And the best way to do that, again, is to make sure you've got good light. So, you know, just to say that if you're looking, look carefully, you know, really actually look. So skin breakdown, the other thing that is important is moisture or incontinence. So where there are those raw red areas, that kind of diaper rash area, um, usually on somebody's bottom or their perineum, which is that whole kind of, you know, bottom area. So if there is that raw red area, you want to clean it well with a neutral wash and then use some kind of a barrier cream. So something that's going to prevent that moisture from sitting right on the skin. So look for products that have dimethicone. So dimethicone is like silicone. So it's like Teflon. It's like it won't allow the water to stick to it. So if you have a product that has dimethicone in it, like a barrier cream that has, and you put a little bit of that on the skin, you don't need much, just a little bit. If you put that on, and if you put it on yourself and then you wash your hands, you'll see that it, the water will just kind of roll off. Vaseline and, you know, if you're sort of, Vaseline works. Um, again, it's, um, it's not optimal, but it certainly works okay. Um, Zinc products, so there are a whole slew of, you know, diaper rash products that have zinc in them. Zinc is great, but the big problem is it's very hard to remove. Goes on easily, but it's really hard to remove. And that's the reason why I would suggest looking for something that has dimethicone. So if you look at the, um, at the list of ingredients, usually well, always on the barrier cream products, it will say what it has in it. If it has dimethicone, you can be pretty sure that that's a good product to use. Um, the main thing you wanna make sure is that you don't put, don't slather it on. You don't need to slather it on. You know, the size of a pea, the thickness of a dime, like just not very much. So, you know, this is an example of, and hopefully, you know, this. Um, doesn't scare you too much, but this is the kind of thing. If you see these heels that look like this, this is when, you know, you really need to, con to let your healthcare professional know what's going on, that this is what you're seeing, and that you want to make sure that there is pressure offloading. That's the big thing that you want to ensure. You know, how did this happen? Because this individual was lying with their heels on the surface of the bed, and not moving, okay, and didn't have anything to support the heels. You just need to float them off the surface of the bed. Like I said, with the pillow, you know, pillows work really well. The other thing to look at is a wound tipping into infection. So these are the kinds of things that we need to look for. And, you know, this is really important to pay attention to because some of the situations that have been in the news um, in the not too distant past have been around, uh, you know, wounds that there's a lot of odor and the healthcare professionals are putting, you know, kitty litter under the bed or other things to try and mask the odor. Odor is an indicator of infection, period. You need to address the problem, not the odor. And the problem is infection. 
So I can't stress that enough that if a wound smells, it smells because there's bacteria in there and that bacteria is, uh, is um, reproducing and needs to be addressed, okay? The other thing too is if a wound isn't healing, so it, that would be if nothing has changed in a chronic wound that has been that way for three weeks and nothing has happened, you know, we've been doing the same thing and it's two months have gone by and nothing has happened, there's a good chance that that wound may be tipping into infection. When there is a lot of drainage, increased drainage from the wound, that's often an indication that, the, that there is infection. That's how the body kind of tries to get rid of the bacteria that's in the wound. It starts to produce more drainage. If, is there redness around the wound, the peri wound? So in other words, the, the intact skin around that wound, is there redness, is there swelling, is there warmth? Uh, you know, those are all indicators that that may be kind of moving into infection. If someone has pain, if they identify that they have an increase or a change in the type of pain. So, you know, is it, is it aching like a toothache and I can't sleep at night where before it was, you know, it was fine. Then that's an indication that there may be infection brewing. And the other one obviously is temperature. If somebody has a temp increased temperature, there's a good chance that there is infection. So what should I know about dressings and treatment? And this is like, you know, your 10 high level, 10,000 kilometers up view. Um, I do, you know, the courses that I offer through York University um, are, uh, so I offer wound care courses through York, through the Health Leadership and Learning Network. Um, if you are a healthcare professional and you are interested, uh, because, you know, as healthcare professionals, we don't learn much of anything around chronic wounds or management of chronic wounds in our undergraduate education program or any education program that we take. Um, we learn some basics and some of the basics that we learn are not current in terms of, you know, the evidence doesn't support the way we may have been taught to do things 10 years ago. So um, healthcare professionals don't always know the right thing to do. They, I would always say that, you know, your healthcare professional is trying to do the best they can. Um, so they're, you know, they're being able to understand a little bit more about the process for family members is really important. But if you are a healthcare professional, then I would encourage you to take a look at the courses we offer through Health Leadership and Learning, but also there are a number of other places where you can, you know, where you can take courses. Wounds Canada has excellent courses. Uh, some of the companies, the industry partners that we have um, also have um, non-commercial uh, um, components that they offer in different academies or institutes in their, um, in their industry. So, you know, you can take a look at those as well. But I really believe that we need to be better informed than we are about chronic wounds. Chronic wounds are not sexy. Um, they are kind of low level in terms of people's real interest in them and they're chronic. So they're, you know, kind of, they go on and on and on. Um, but we really, th the thing that we need to remember is that chronic wounds are often the reason why people are in hospital. So sepsis, for example, which is, you know, generalized big infection, often starts with uh, an opening in the skin. And it could start with, you know, um, a pressure injury, for example, so a bed sore. Uh, diabetic foot, um, a diabetic foot ulcers, are one of the main causes of amputation. So we need to really be paying attention to these a lot more than we do. Like I said, they're not exciting and sexy. They don't get the same kind of press as you know, some of the other kinds of things like you know, um, cancer care or heart and stroke, but they really are critical to people's health. So what do I know, what should I know about dressings and treatment? Well, first of all, you need to understand how wounds heal. 
So chronic, so an acute wound, you know, you cut yourself, goes through this process, same process, but it goes through it in this uh, in this way. So you have that inflammatory phase, which is lasts for about four days. That's when the body is removing the bacteria and the debris. You have the proliferative phase, which is where you have new tissue growing. That's usually day four to 24. And the maturation phase goes, can go on quite a bit longer with scar formation and strengthening. So the maturation phase can be, you know, like a month, in a month's time, but it can also, for some types of wounds, it can also go on for up to two years. Your skin can take that long to, or the tissue can take that long to, uh, to heal. Um, never gets back to the way it went to the tensile strength before, as it was before, but it still will be, the, the wound will be closed. Um, typically, chronic wounds get stuck in that inflammatory phase, and that's the problem because you have that sort of continuing activity that's going on in that wound bed and the opportunity then for bacteria, etc., to happen. So, you know, I'm not going in this in, in big detail, and I'm hoping that I'm not, uh, you're not falling asleep. Um, the other way of looking at this is kind of like a damaged house. So if you think about, you know, a house that has a fire. So what happens when there's a house where there's, there's been a house fire? So the first thing that happens is the utility workers come in and they shut everything off. So they shut off the power, they shut off the water, you know, they shut everything down. So that's like hemostasis. So the body just kind of, that's blood clotting, okay? When blood clots, that's the same sort of thing as those utility workers going and closing everything, you know, turning off all the, the, the taps, basically. The inflammatory phase is when you have the non-skilled individual people coming in, you have a contractor who says, okay, this is what we need to do. And they organize and this is what they do. So they get rid of all the, the debris that is in the wound. That's when you see that sort of, um, you, you sometimes see a bit of redness around a wound but you start to also see the, um, the sloughy material, the kind of, you know, the, the garbage that's in the wound. Um, the granulated, granulation or the proliferation is when you have the framers, the skilled workers coming in. So the plumber, the electrician, the carpenter, they're the ones who are, you know, who are putting up the walls, who are, um, who are framing in the plumbing and the electrical, et cetera. The maturation phase is the interior finishing. So like painting the walls, putting down the carpets and doing the hard landscaping outside. So that's why that can take a longer period of time, right? So like I said, the inflammatory phase tends to be the one where uh, chronic wounds are stalled. And that's the whole sort of art um, of wound care is to really look at how do we you know, how do we move out of that stalled position? So we need to, uh, you know, here's another heel. Um, so we need to treat the underlying cause. I mean, treatment needs to be focused on, you can't just slap a dressing on this and hope it goes away. You, without treating the pressure and wounds often, it's pressure, it's incontinence, it's poor nutrition or not adequate hydration, it's infection. Um, you know, or other chronic disease conditions. So it could be a number of, so diabetes, for example, or it could be, um, you know, a, a chronic a heart condition. All of those things are going to potentially have an impact on circulation and on the ability of the skin or the tissue to actually heal that wound. So only when the, well, not only when, but the underlying cause needs to be treated alongside of the actual wound. So, you know, if, if your mom has a heel that looks like this and nothing has been done to move her heel off the surface of the bed, then this wound is not going to heal. You know, it doesn't matter what you put on the thing. It's still going to be there because you haven't relieved the pressure. So the dressings uh, need to be sort of the next step but really the underlying cause has to be looked at. And that's when you also begin to think to yourself, okay, is this, 
are we going to be able to heal this or is this going to be just a maintenance wound? Um, is it something that we really are not going to, it's non-healable, you know? And that, a lot of that is based on cr chronic disease conditions. Um, primarily, that would be the one, because that's something that we can't change the chronic disease condition. We can certainly do something about pressure, about managing incontinence, about nutrition and hydration, and we can do something about infection for the most part. So, but you know, the chronic disease, if they've got chronic kidney disease or diabetes, we're not going to be able to actually change those conditions, right? But we can look at particularly around pressure, um, pressure, moisture, nutrition, infection, okay? They're the big ones. So dressings should provide a moist wound bed environment. This is critical, to wounds healing because if you put something on there that lets the moisture sit uh, on the wound itself and the the area around the wound the peri wound what you are going to end up with is maceration in other words it's kind of like when you sit if you sit in a bathtub uh, too long or goes to the pool too long your skin gets all wrinkly that's the precursor to maceration. So you don't want that to happen. And this is what's really critical. And I put this in here, I know this is more of a sciencey kind of slide, but moisture vapor transfer is critical. And the current dressings that we have available provide moisture vapor transfer, MVT. They will have on their information what their MVT actually is. And to me, that's, you know, that's great. But what's really important is to understand that a wound that is too wet, so in other words, that moisture sits on that wound, can't process that healing cascade. It can't move towards closure. And um, a wound that has, um, you know, that has an MVT, has moisture vapor transfer, that any, any dressing that doesn't provide moisture vapor transfer can stall that closure by keeping that wound bed saturated. So you need to have uh, effective moisture vapor transfer. So a good example of this would be um, if you have a wet basement. So, you know, every once in a while it really rains and you get a puddle in your basement. So the best way to deal with the puddle in your basement other than just looking at it and ignoring it, is to, and again, treating the underlying cause. Why is that puddle happening? But the way to get rid of the puddle itself is to spread it out over a larger uh, area. So in other words, you're, you're moving that wet area around so that there's less of it over a surface and putting fans on it. So when you put a fan on a puddle, it will help to evaporate the water, okay? And that's moisture vapor transfer. It's exactly the same principle. And dressings that use this principle work really, really well. They're very effective in removing the excess moisture off a wound. And that's what you wanna see happening, or that's what you want to have happen. So dressings, like if you just put a gauze dressing, you know, um, a gauze dressing and tape, that's going to do absolutely nothing in terms of moisture vapor transfer. It has, gauze has no capacity. Um, those abdominal pads that we have used for probably since Florence Nightingale, so like, you know, 150 years or more, um, those ABD pads in the hospital or that they send home with people, they're, they don't do anything in terms of allowing moisture vapor transfer. They get soaked and they just sit on the wound. So um, you want products that provide that moisture vapor transfer. So dressings should, dressings should wick away that excess moisture from the wound bed. They should, if there is odor, they should deal with the odor. So there are different types of dressings that do that really, really well. And they're based on salt, um, silver dressings, um, honey, um, uh, methylene blue is another product.
product that works really well. Um, so, you know, and some of the iodine products as well um, work really well. So there is, there are ways of dealing with odor that, uh, that interact with the wound bed itself. And those are the kinds of dressings that if there is odor, if there's bacteria, those are the kinds of things that should be used. Getting rid of the slough, which is that yellow gray tissue that's in the wound bed. So the thing that is kind of covering that pink granulating tissue that's in the base of the wound, you, that needs to be gotten rid of. There are different ways of doing that. The dressing should not stick to the wound bed because something that sticks to the wound bed, sorry, something that sticks to the wound bed is going to, um, something that sticks to the wound bed is going to actually pull at the nice granulating tissue uh, and that you, we don't want to have that happen. We want that granulating tissue to just be forming very nicely, covered with something that is not tr uh, traumatic to the, to the wound bed. So um, you want to make sure that it has a, an atraumatic or a not a heavy adhesive border. So not something that's gonna be really difficult to take off because that's, uh, that's going to tear at the, the peri wound skin or that fragile skin. You know, we talked about uh, elderly people who have fragile skin. So you don't want something on there that's gonna pull at their skin. And transparent film is something that you really want to avoid. So, and I, I wanna show this now, the next image may be unsettling. I, I don't know, because, you know, for me, this is like nothing, but um, I wanna show you this because it's really important to understand what it is about those transparent films like Opsite, for example, that are really not useful in this situation. So the problem with transparent film is you have somebody who has a skin tear, which is common, right? Not that uncommon with uh, fragile skin. And um, a transparent film was put on top of it. The problem with the transparent film is that first of all, it doesn't allow the, that moisture vapor transfer to occur. It doesn't allow um, the drainage that comes with a skin tear um, because that fluid is just, you know, it, it seeps out of the wound bed. It doesn't allow that to evaporate off the wound. It keeps it there. So it, it macerates and saturates the wound bed and the peri-wound skin. And then the other thing is, it's really hard to get these off, uh, these transparent films, because they're adherent, right? So I don't know if you've ever had this experience of having a transparent film put on something, but to try to take it off, um, you're, you often end up tearing the skin. <coughs> Excuse me. And there are ways of doing this, but really the ideal is not to use this. Just avoid those transparent films. They're really good. Transparent films work very well to, um, if someone has an intravenous needle, um, an IV, they're great to keep that in place. That's what they're really good for. They are not good for skin tears at all. So instead, what needs to be used is a non-adherent dressing. So these are just examples of, you know, I'm not promoting uh, one thing or another, but Mepitel Adaptic Touch um, or the Absorbent Acrylic Dressing, anything that is a non-adherent contact layer. And any um, the companies all will have on their packaging, they'll say, you know, non-adherent contact layer. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that you want to look for. So the wound is made worse by the removal of that transparent film. And, it, but what's supplied over it, so when it is removed and cleaned, the area is cleaned, then the uh, non-adherent um, contact layer, so in this case, it's either Mepitel or Adaptic Touch. Uh, so those dressings are used. That can stay on the wound and then a cover dressing, so um, an absorbent pad, not an ABD pad, but one of the newer versions of abdominal pad, of the absorbent pad, so like Mesorb, 
something like that. Um, and then wrap it up, just wrap it up. So don't use tape, you know, keep tape off these. So important to think about this, um, protect your loved one's uh, fragile skin from, you know, hitting things. So padding is always good. Um, think about, you know, is there anything that they are uh, potentially going to hit themselves on um, the, we, the side of their wheelchair or the bedside, you know, the rails at the bedside or something. Uh, you want to make sure that they are, um, or the, you know, the bottom of the wheelchair, you want to make sure that they're protected, okay? So what can I expect from healthcare professionals? And I think what's important to think about here is communicate. So hopefully your healthcare professional is communicating with you and with uh, your the uh, patient, um, you really need, if they're not, you need to really, you know, talk to them about what's going on. And remember too, that when, you know, often when healthcare professionals are dress doing dressing changes, for them, it's part of their day, right? They have tasks. It's one of the tasks that they have to complete. They've got a whole bunch of uh, patients or residents that they need to look after and so they're kind of in they're often in a hurry it's not that they're in a hurry because they're not good healthcare professionals it's they're in a hurry because they have they're overloaded you know they have a lot of people to see a lot of things that they have to do but you really need to say you know um, I'd like to stay and I'd like to take a look, assuming that that's okay with your family, with the person who has the wound. I mean, you need to really make sure that they're okay with that too. Um, you should ask to see the wound and the dressing when it's being done, you know, to go in when that dressing is being changed. Um, the attitude or the approach to take with that is as a team player and a collaborator. This is not something where you're taking pictures and you're threatening lawsuits. I really, you know, I, I think that's totally, uh, personally, I think that's, that just isn't a good way to interact with each other. I think what's important is that we consider this as a collaborative effort, that you're gonna do what you can to help your mom or your dad or whomever, um, uh, eat or do whatever it is that they need to do to help that wound heal. Um, you want to ask to take a look at the wound and the dressing to see how things are progressing. Your healthcare professional should be able to explain what they're doing in regards to treatment. And the courses that I teach with uh, York University, um, we're offering this online as well. We, I've moved to an online uh, offering as well. So take a look at the uh, uh, Helen um, website to see. I'm promoting these courses because I really want people to have the education and the information that they need to be able to do the best possible job. So that's my reason for doing that. Um, but if people in, you know, healthcare professionals should be able to explain what they're doing and why they're doing it. And they should know the rationale. Why am I using a foam dressing? You know, I need to know why. I, it's not just because that's the order. Um, I need to be able to talk to you about the wound improvement. And if the wound is a maintenance wound, because there are other conditions, health conditions, or for whatever reason, then I need to be able to explain um, and have that explained to me as to why you know, uh, what's going on here. Um, and if it's not a healable wound or a maintenance wound, um, uh, if it's not healable or it's a maintenance wound, then I need to know then what should we be doing uh, to keep mom comfortable, for example, you know, decrease the frequency of dressing changes maybe, or can you uh, take on some of that, you know, if it's just painting with, with betadine, for example, can you maybe do that? Can you be taught to do this? Um, you know, take on some of this as a really positive way to help your family member 
actually do the best they can possibly do. Because like I said, this is not the healthcare professional's wound. It's the wound of your family member, your loved one. So we need to do what we can to be able to support that and to support them. Um, they should be able to provide you with information or resources. So, you know, where can I get more information about the condition, the situation? Is it a diabetic foot ulcer? What do I need to know about these to prevent this from happening again? Um, other kinds of resources like that. Uh, it, you need to have that access as well, you know, at a level that is, um, that is understandable for you, as opposed to, you know, you're not a necessarily a healthcare professional yourself. So you want to, and even if you are, sometimes when you're dealing with things that are family related, it's a lot more upsetting and you may not remember some of the things that you might remember when you're dealing just with patients. Just saying. So this is, you know, basic dressing selection. So this is, um, I put this in here because I think it's useful for you to be able to see the kinds of things that are available now that certainly were not available maybe 20 years ago. Some of them were, but you know, a lot of things have changed over time. It's the same way that uh, you know, um, uh, surgical procedures have changed. Um, you know, the kinds of um, anesthetic uh, um, components have changed. Lots of, you know, healthcare medicine has moved forward. And dressings, wound care dressings, have moved forward as well. There's been a, a lot of research and development, sorry, there's been a lot of research and development uh, to deal with these kinds of uh, wounds. And companies have, have put a lot of work and money, obviously, into creating much better products. And we need to be really thinking about, you know, what are those products? Um, so just to kind of finish off, I know we're getting close to the end of our time. This is something that you can, um, uh, hopefully we can make available to you on in some fashion, Tanya. Um, so that people could, you know, you can look at this. So is it a barrier that we're using? Why are we doing it? What does it do? An absorbent acrylic dressing, there is only one kind, 3M makes it. It's a great product um, to protect the skin. Foam dressings, hydrocolloids, how do these work? Uh, you can use Google to look these up as well. You know, that's another option. Um, to look up any specific dress, a specific product, you can look that up and you will get the information that you, that you need. Um, so what all of these different products do, these are the basic selections of products. And this is the contact info. I just wanna go back to this one slide for a second. Um, just to let you know that the other thing that we are thinking about doing is offering um, a, a series of webinars that would be focused for family members, so not healthcare professionals, but family members to go into this in a little bit more detail. So that's coming um, as a kind of a little webinar series that we're contemplating doing. So that may be something that you might be interested in. I know this has been a really short uh, overview, but I feel very strongly that people need to know um, what's going on. Don't wait until, you know, you're horrified by what you see. You want to be aware every step of the way of what's happening. So I'll finish there Thank and uh, give we you the We have a question. We have a question. Yeah. Um, uh, Colleen in the chat line has said, my mother had fluid on legs, um, liver cancer, perhaps, with some small wounds. Community RN is involved. Over top of the dressing, she currently has a Coban wrap. Does that prevent moisture transfer? Question mark. No, no. And actually, the and I'm I you know getting into the sort of detail of the different types of wounds. Um, venous legs are really common with older people, so they're those you know large larger legs, um, swelling in the lower legs. This is something that happens to people as they get older. I could do a whole thing on. Um, venous legs. Um, the compression is the best 
um, it's the gold standard for venous leg ulcers. And once people have had, once the wounds heal, then your mum needs to be in compression stockings. Okay, like that's, she needs to be in compression stockings forever. Um, there are several different kinds, and but I would really encourage you to do that. Um, the Coban uh, dressings, Coban 2, Coban 2 Light, they're really great. Um, they um, are used over uh, pretty well any type of, of dressing. So that's perfect. That's perfect, yeah. As long as it's being applied properly. <laughs> Thanks, Rosemary. Thanks, Rosemary. It, and, and from Health Leadership and Learning here at York University, we too agree this is a collaborative relationship between yourselves as, as family members and the healthcare providers who are working with your loved ones. And it's, uh, communication is key. That's why uh, we 100% agree with Rosemary's approach here that communication is key. And Rosemary, it sounds like um, you're also saying that as a family member, you are with your family, your loved one, visiting them. You may be seeing things that are happening, like if they're sitting in their wheelchair and something is rubbing against their skin, or if their footwear is a little tight and they may, they may notice something like a callus happening on their foot, that, you know, that's an opportunity for you to say something. Mm -hmm. And say it in a way that is collaborative. You know, don't, I mean, I think one of, as, as a nurse, one of the hardest things is when I'm working my butt off and a family member says something in an accusatory kind of way. Not that I've really ever, well, I've had that happen a couple of times, but you know, it, because it puts you on the defensive and that's not what you want. You want to work together. You want them to collaborate with you. So, you know, talking to them in a way that's going to be, you know, I noticed this and I'm wondering, you know, what can we do about this is probably the way to approach it. Um, we have someone asking, else asking a question. What if she wears compression stockings and has wounds? Do you still wear the stockings? No, no, you should. Well, depending, um, the only kind that you can wear would be like a Dima wear, which is not exactly a stocking. No, when people have wounds, they really need to be in compression wraps because the compression wrap is designed to go over a wound. Um, a, a compression stocking is not. Thanks, Catherine, for sharing that question with us. And we are at 2 p.m. here, Eastern time. Um, and I don't want to keep it everyone from uh, your days. Thank everyone saying thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you, Rosemary, uh, for putting together this presentation today. Uh, again, this is a topic that we're really passionate about when it comes to wound care and also supporting not only healthcare providers, but yourselves as, um, as family members and caregivers, people giving support to your family. Uh, you're very welcome. Lots of thank yous for a great presentation. Rosemary, any last words? Um, take a look at the um, Health Leadership and Learning Network website. Uh, look for information around, wound, particularly around wound care. I mean, from my perspective anyway, look for um, uh, the courses on wound care. And as I said, I, I, we will be offering something that will be uh, in a little bit more detail for um, family caregivers. This was just, you know, a really brief overview of a very complex topic. Right. And if, you're, if there's healthcare providers too on the line who've been listening in, if there's additional information you'd like us to make available or cover in any of our webinars that we're doing, these are our free online webinars, please let us know. Or to family members as well, if there's any additional topics you'd like us to cover, please let us know. Um, uh, this is an ongoing practice we'd like to keep up is offering uh, these one hour um, sessions to people as, as general information uh, and keep this going so that uh, that uh, we can help you do what you need to do um, in your daily lives or at work. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you for joining us and spending your, your time, your valuable time here with us today. And we hope to see you soon.